Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to all of you on this uh, sunny, ah, may not, but nevertheless, uh, we are happy to see you here and uh, a warm, warm welcome also to John Jardin and his coming from Utrecht's Politis Institute, what is called Swedish Institute of International Affairs. Um, and um, you will be introduced uh, in a minute uh, by uh, Andreas Forsby, who will moderate the session. Uh, I'm Bertel Hulin, I'm uh, representing the uh, Center for Military Studies and also Think China, uh, which you know, all of you, uh, <laughs> hopefully, uh, it's a think tank uh, comprising all uh, universities in uh, Copenhagen. Um, the theme today is uh, the influence policy of China. And uh, if you remember last year, exactly this day, I guess, there was this speech by, um, uh, by Pence, the uh, vice minister of the United States. And what did he say? He said, in this minute, China all over in the world, especially in the United States, is influencing uh, the uh, domestic policy. And uh, well, we cannot tolerate that. And uh, after a while, uh, there were a lot of reports, uh, conferences all over the world, in Copenhagen, by the way, in Canada, in <laughs> Singapore, and also now in Sweden. So I will give the floor to you to introduce, and then so more right, later on we will have uh, one hour and a half, and uh, uh, all the best for this conference. Thanks to Bertel uh, and Casper uh, from Think China for organizing this event. And um, on behalf of NIAS, the Nordic Institute of Asian Studies, I would also like to welcome you. I'm Andreas Boy Forsby. I'm a postdoc researcher here at the Institute, specializing uh, primarily in the rise of China, uh, its implications for the world. Uh, I've primarily focused on the security implications of China's rise, but also in recent years on Danish Chinese relations and quite recently on Sino-Nordic relations. And it, I think it's in that capacity that I'm here today to moderate this seminar. Uh, so of course also a warm uh, welcome to uh, Björn Jardin from Udrichs Politisk Institute, where he's uh, heading the Asia program. Uh, Björn has uh, written several uh, academic articles that are quite well cited, I would say, but he's also a very widely used commentator in the Swedish media. Um, so uh, he can <coughs> play very, uh, various roles, I would say, uh, that are also interesting in this context. So um, I think, um, of course, beyond today, we'll be talking about Swedish-Chinese relations. And I think it's a very, very interesting topic right now. To begin with, it's always interesting to co compare, uh, I, mean, I mean, our own relations with our uh, our very close neighbors from Sweden. Um, I think that um, on the surface of it, you could say that Danish uh, relations with China are quite comparable to, uh, to Sweden's relations with China. They are both small liberal states, um, highly developed uh, and, and have, you know, over the years engaged quite, uh, quite uh, intensely with China. And I think that, um, you can say that even if they have been trying to engage China, both of them quite intensely over the years, they have over the years, however, moved in quite different directions. On the one hand, you have Denmark, which has uh, engaged with China on the terms of a comprehensive strategic partnership agreement that was uh, signed in 2008. We have formalized our relations with, with China quite significantly. Uh, we have signed several memorandums of understanding. We have had about seven to eight high-level uh, visits to China, Danish ministerial delegations going to China each year for the past decade. So Danish-Chinese relations have been quite deep and close over the past decade since we signed the Comprehensive Strategic Partnership Agreement. On the other hand, you have Sweden, uh, which um, has opted for a more sort of ad hoc relationship, less formalized, fewer memorandums of understanding, uh, fewer high-level visits to China uh, over the past decade, I would say. So um, that's at least one thing that is interesting when you compare the two countries. And also, I think that 
Denmark and Danish ministers and Danish uh, politicians in general are quite uh, happy about emphasizing how we are the only Nordic country with a comprehensive strategic partnership agreement with China. So that's also something to note. Furthermore, um, you could say that why both of these two countries, these two Scandinavian countries, perceive of themselves as uh, staunch supporters of uh, liberal democracy on the international stage. They have, uh, however, moved in different directions when it comes to the way, the, the role played by political values in their relations with China. You have, on the one hand, uh, uh, Sweden, which has become known as, a, you could say, uh, a moral great power. That's one way to put it. It's been uh, quite vocal in its uh, its way of uh, criticizing China when it comes to human rights and, and, uh, and, and liberal democratic values. And even if you could say that Denmark is also quite active in the way they put f political values into the, uh, their relations with China, they are, I mean the Danish government, they tend to be more discreet in the way they perceive, pursue these values. So there is a difference here which is also I think quite interesting. Uh, for today's seminar. Um, so I should also maybe add that I think that Sweden is quite an interesting case in the sense of how China has chosen to punish small states. Uh, we have seen it repeatedly over the years, especially when, so, hey, okay, when small states are crossing what China perceives to be its red lines. And we have seen it previously in the case of Denmark back in 2009 when, we, uh, when the Dalai Lama visited uh, Las Vegas. We have seen it, of course, uh, even more uh, explicitly in the case of Norway with its six years freeze of political relations with China. And now we are witnessing something that might turn out to be along the same lines of what we've seen previously. When small states cross China's line, there will be consequences. It can be in the sense of uh, of uh, a political freeze or sanctions or whatever, but China will, um, as you could say, put pressure on these small states when they, cro when they step on their uh, feet, so to speak. And I think that uh, Bjorn, of course, will tell us much more about this. Uh, there was one very interesting metaphor that was put forward by David Bandurski. He, tol he talked about how China, uh, the Chinese embassy in particular, likes to uh, break the porcelain, uh, and I think uh, Bjorn went for another phrase in his uh, recent uh, brief, uh, brief, where he talked about how uh, how the Chinese embassy in Stockholm has been pursuing a propaganda campaign. That was the way he puts it. So these are quite stark words, but I think uh, when you read through the, the brief, and I have of course had the opportunity to do so, I think uh, it is. Uh, warned it the way, it, or justified the way it's being phrased. And so one final word for me before uh, I'll give the word to Björn. So the past week we had the, uh, we had the Swedish uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs publishing uh, a report on Swedish-Chinese relations. So I think this is even more timely having you here today. And I think you might also have a chance today to, to, to tell us more about what's in that report. So with that, I think I'll just hand over the floor to you, Bjorn. Thank you for coming. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Andreas, and thank to Bertel and Kasper, and thanks to uh, University of Copenhagen and NIAS. Um, I'm very happy to be back at NIAS. I uh, did a stay here as a master's student many years ago, <laughs> at least in the context of my lifespan nine years ago, I, I think it was, stayed at Nordisk Collegium and uh, stayed at the old NIAS and, and had a great time uh, there. That really helped my, my uh, uh, research uh, since then. So I'm very happy to be back. Um, um, I can say a few words uh, about myself. I uh, do research primarily on international relations. Uh, I focus on China, but I also focus on uh, Japan, I focus on Korea and the role of Un United States in uh, East Asia, primarily. Uh, in recent years, I had opportunities to 
spent some time also researching Europe-China relations and specifically Sweden-China relations. And uh, uh, I think people here also have that experience when you start working on China, you realize that people are interested not only in what's going on in East Asia, but also how China impacts our uh, part of the world. Uh, and at the Swedish Institute of International Affairs, we are putting more focus on Sweden-China relations, both on the topic I will be speaking on today, but also other aspects of this very multifaceted relationship. Um, the Swedish Institute of International Affairs is uh, an independent institute in Stockholm. We do academic research, we do policy analysis, and we also function as a platform for information and debate about international issue for uh, all sectors of Swedish society. Um, today I will speak on three points related to what I call a propaganda campaign uh, conducted by China in Sweden and I will explain why I think it's a campaign and why I think it's a campaign of propaganda. First I will um, speak on the nature of the campaign how it got started, uh, what are the characteristics of it. Uh, then I will discuss the effects of the campaign, primarily on Swedish society, Swedish views on China, and Swedish China policy. And finally, I will uh, speculate about the motives behind the campaign. Why is the Chinese government launching a campaign in Sweden at this exact moment? And together with uh, a colleague of mine, Viking Buman, um, we published uh, this short report uh, this summer. Um, and uh, things, has, things have developed since we published this report. So I will also try to, to give some updates about recent developments in Sweden-China relations. And things related to this campaign is in the news in Sweden more or less every week uh, for, for uh, well past one and a half year now. Um, what is the message from the Chinese embassy in Stockholm? Well, uh, in the views of the embassy, uh, the public discussion on China in Sweden is not fair. Not only is it biased, <coughs> it's also full of lies and it's based on uh, hidden agendas among some people to hurt Sweden-China relations and to hurt China. That is the gist of uh, the campaign. Um, according to the embassy, a relatively small number of people in Sweden has have an outsized influence on the Swedish discussion of China. And this quite small group of people uh, is precisely driven by these hidden agendas uh, and biases, uh, which have negative effects on Swedish-China policy and Sweden-China relations. So this is the message coming from the Chinese government and the Chinese embassy in uh, Stockholm, that this is the uh, situation that they face in the diplomatic mission in Stockholm. And this selection of some terms used by the Chinese embassy in statements, in interviews, in op-eds, in the media, show sort of the kind of, of uh, 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 messages coming from the embassy. Um, uh, Swedish views on China are driven by political motives, racial hatred, ignorance, there are anti-China provocations going on, a lot of unfounded accusations, maybe even childish arrogance, xenophobia, groundless suspicions and so on. Um, and uh, these kind of accusations are 
uh, uh, seen in primarily statements published on uh, the website of uh, the Chinese embassy in uh, Sweden. Um, and uh, why, why I call this a campaign is because it's uh, quite sustained. Um, we started to notice a change in the messages coming from the Chinese mission in Sweden toward late 2017 and early uh, 2018. And this continued over 2018 with a peak in uh, uh, September of that year. Uh, and in late summer of uh, last year, it was an incident in Stockholm where three Chinese tourists, a family of three, uh, went on holiday to Sweden and when they arrived at their hostel in Stockholm, uh, they realized, or staff realized, that they uh, arrived one day too early. Uh, but they thought it was a good idea to, to stay in the lobby and sleep in the lobby for one night and then they could check in uh, the next day. And this led to uh, a disagreement with the hostel staff and the hostel staff called the police who uh, took this family away from the premises uh, and drove them to a suburb of uh, Stockholm. And initially this incident was not known in the public discussion, but um, after some time, uh, Chinese authorities uh, referred to this incident as a case of Swedish authorities not respecting the basic human rights of Chinese visiting Sweden. Um, and this led to harsh criticism, not only from the Chinese embassy in Stockholm, uh, but also from uh, the foreign ministry in Beijing. Uh, uh, this also led to a lot of uh, uh, attention in the Swedish media and a satirical TV program at the Swedish national television uh, did a skit on this incident. And this skit included some insensitive, racially charged jokes about Chinese people. Uh, and this uh, show also received a lot of criticism in Swedish media, but they received even harsher criticism from Chinese authorities who accused uh, Swedish media uh, of uh, 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 acting against the basic uh, rights of mankind and being driven by, by racism and so on. Uh, so during the fall of 2018, uh, we saw es escalation on the messaging coming from the Chinese mission in Sweden. However, after <coughs> this incident died out, the messages continued. Uh, when people uh, published uh, negative reporting uh, about the activities of the Chinese Communist Party, bringing up issues such as uh, the situation in Xinjiang, uh, the state of the Swedish citizens, citizen Gui Minhai, who is being held uh, in China, uh, and, and uh, Chinese investments in Sweden and so on. Uh, the Chinese uh, embassy uh, has kept a very high uh, profile in the media, publishing op-eds and, and making statements full of personal accusations uh, on their uh, website and also receiving interviews from many of the larger Swedish uh, media. Um, and when it comes to the topics that uh, this campaign is concerned about, as you can see from this pie chart, it's quite a broad uh, range of topics. It concerns women high, China's human rights records, China in the world, the Belt and Road Initiative and so on, uh, issues concerned to Taiwan and Tibet, uh, and also Sweden's human <coughs> rights uh, record, that Sweden is not uh, respecting the rights of, of 
Chinese citizens, citizens visiting Sweden. Um, so the campaign is energetic and it is sustained. Uh, it's still going on, it shows no signs of abating. Uh, the last couple of weeks there are new uh, statements from the embassy criticizing Swedish public discussion on uh, China. And the reason we choose to call it a propaganda campaign and maybe not a public diplomacy campaign uh, is two. The first is that the fact that propaganda has traditionally not been a bad word in Chinese Communist Party vocabulary. Uh, also in their uh, English translations of different units within the party and the state, they used uh, the name propaganda until a few years ago. But the tone of uh, the campaign at least strikes me very similar to the kind of uh, uh, propaganda that we are seeing within China. It's not really open to discussing, uh, discussion, it's more concerned about condemn, condemning uh, 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 other viewpoints on China than those uh, advocated by the Communist Party. Uh, Andreas gave a very good background, I think, about uh, how China's relations with the different Nordic countries have looked like. Uh, we never really had any big political disagreements with the Chinese in Sweden. We never had anything similar to what Denmark and Norway had in the 1990s and the 2000s. Uh, Sweden-China relations has focused on economic cooperation. Uh, it's true that the Swedish government has been quite outspoken when it comes to the human rights record in China, and this has also uh, happened not only through crisis, but also working together with the Chinese sides in improving the human rights situation in China, for example, through uh, human rights uh, education at Beijing University, which is funded by the Swedish government. Uh, but we never really saw any big political disagreements. Uh, the biggest issue in Sweden-China relations for many years happened after the Swedish Prime Minister, Jöran Persson, visited China in 1996. And he remarked then in passing that political stability might be good for economic development. And this uh, caught on, he received a lot of domestic criticism about this, and no Swedish prime minister <laughs> dared visit in China for over 10 years after that. But that was the domestic political issue in Sweden, not an issue between Sweden and uh, China. So what we're seeing in recent years, what we started with the abduction of the Swedish citizen Gui Min Hai from his uh, uh, vacation home in Thailand in 2015, is a new level of disagreement on the political level in Sweden-China relations, which is new to us. But the campaign is also unique in a European context at the moment. We haven't seen anything similar in any other European country known to me. And I talked to a lot of colleagues in, in more or less all European countries to see if there were similar signs. But the nature of this campaign and the fact that it has been going on for such a long time is unique in the European context, I dare to say. Uh, so who, who's, who are the targets in this campaign from the Chinese side? Well, as I said, the problem here uh, in the Chinese perspective is that a small group of people in Sweden are spreading lies about China. So who are these people, according to the uh, Chinese government? Well, primarily, it's mass media and journalists. Uh, both media companies, but also individual journalists who publish articles about China are being uh, uh, named and accused. It's human rights activists who uh, are involved in issues such as the situation in Xinjiang uh, and also the case of uh, Gui Min Hai. Uh, there are politicians who are making critical statements about China, government authorities. Uh, last week, the Chinese embassy stated that uh, the Swedish security service is an anti-China element. After an interview with uh, the uh, head of the unit of uh, counter espionage, who uh, claimed uh, an increase in 
so-called refugee espionage uh, among Tibetan and Uyghur communities in uh, Sweden. So also government uh, authorities are being criticized in, in this campaign, not only civil society. And also people like me, uh, scholars uh, who are uh, 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 writing uh, 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 things about China and saying things about China in the media. Uh, uh, and this is, is my own, um, uh, uh, this is a remark criticizing myself after this report was, was published. For example, this is just one example um, uh, about the kind of, of uh, accusations being published by uh, the embassy. And I was interviewed by, by Swedish national television after the release of, of this report and shortly thereafter the, the embassy uh, published this uh, statement to criticize me. But it happened to, to uh, uh, a lot of people, a lot of scholars too, uh, voicing opinions about China. Um, so, so this uh, campaign, uh, it's not the only uh, public diplomacy activities being conducted by the Chinese embassy in Sweden in recent years. And, and some part of the public affairs world is more focused on collaboration rather on accusing the Swedish public discussion on China. Uh, for example, the Chinese embassy is working with uh, two organizations, the Swedish China Business Council and the so-called BRICS organization, which is part of, or very closely connected to the LaRouche movement in Sweden, uh, in order to so promote sorry. to the LaRouche movement, oh, okay, yeah. uh, the European Labour uh, Party. Very fringe organization in Sweden. Uh, but the embassy is working with these organizations to promote the Belt and Road Initiative in Sweden. And, and as a side note, Sweden has not been very active when it comes to the Belt and Road initiative. Uh, the Swedish government has been among the European countries more reluctant to engage with this signature foreign policy project of uh, China's leader Xi Jinping. Um, so how about the effects of the campaign? Uh, if we start with the Swedish media coverage of uh, China, uh, this uh, graph shows the correlation between critical embassy statements in green and the Swedish media reaction to this campaign as such. Uh, so as, as we see here, uh, the very fact that the Chinese embassy is conducting this kind of activities has led to media attention in Sweden. And the greater part of this media attention has been quite negative. And a lot of voices in Swedish media is portraying this as an attempt to interfere with a free and open discussion in Swedish society. To try to, to uh, scare people who are uh, critical of China from participating in, in uh, the debate. This is how some Swedish media is portraying this. Uh, uh, in my understanding, uh, the fact that um, the Swedish media is giving attention to this campaign has also led to attention to other issues uh, or activities of the Chinese Communist Party, both within China and outside of China. And a big part of this reporting is also kind of critical pointing out human rights abuses within China, such as uh, 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 Xinjiang, uh, and pointing out uh, alleged negative aspects of the Belt and Road Initiative, and so on. Uh, so it seems that this very campaign has fed into and contributed to an even more negative media coverage of China and Sweden. And this is quite interesting, since the stated aim of the campaign is to make Swedish public discussion of China more positive. But it seems to me that it had the opposite effect, at least so far. How about public opinion then? Has this campaign in any way affected how ordinary Swedes think about China? Uh, and this is more difficult to measure we don't have a lot of good data, 
but we have at least one useful data point, and that is the Pew Research Center Global Attitude Survey. And it's been conducted once a year, and one of the questions is, do you have a favorable or unfavorable view of China? And Pew asks people in around 30 countries, and Sweden has for a number of years been included in this survey. And the last survey took place, the previous survey took place in the fall of uh, 2018, and the latest one was just released the other week. So the latest survey might reflect effects on Swedish public opinion from this uh, campaign. And this is a comparison. To the left we have the result from 2018, and to the right we have the result from 2019. And it might be difficult for you to see, but to the left we can see that 52% of Swedes have an unfavorable view of China, which is at a higher range of European opinion, but still sort of in the middle. In 2019, however, this figure has climbed to 70%. And Sweden is now by far, according to this survey, the most negative public toward China. 70% of Swedes have an unfavorable view of China. Um, and if we look at all the countries included in this survey, we can note that it's only one country, Japan, which has an even more negative view of China than Sweden has. Swedes, for example, are quite a lot more negative about China than our Americans, which might be interesting to pay attention to. Uh, of course, uh, I can't say for sure that this campaign has affected the results as shown in this public opinion poll, but I think it still lends support to the view that the campaign also had effects on Swedish public opinion, not only the media coverage, and that it has brought more negative views of the Chinese government in Sweden. One possible effect of this campaign is self-censorship. Why would this campaign lead to self-censorship? Well, one key characteristic of the campaign is that the embassy names individual scholars, journalists, activists, and so on, and publish harsh criticism on their webpage. Uh, and this might lead some people who otherwise would be open to voice critical opinions on China in public to be more hesitant about doing so. This is not, not something that has been studied so far. It's difficult to study, but I think um, we should still consider it as a possible effect. And I think when thinking about self-censorship, uh, we, we might divide uh, the Swedish population into two halves or two parts. One that doesn't really have anything to lose about being critical of China and being accused by the Chinese government. For example, a lot of the big Swedish newspapers and journalists and so on being active in criticizing China are not really dependent on uh, contacts with the Chinese government in any way other than getting visa for their correspondence to visiting China. And also some of the human rights activists uh, might not uh, are not only uh, are not uh, also that dependent on on uh, keeping keeping good contacts with with the Chinese government. But for other people that might not be the case. For, for scholars working on China, such as myself, uh, and for business people, I think quite a few people might fear uh, uh, costs being publicly accused by uh, the Chinese government. So one possible effect, which is difficult to measure of this campaign, might be self-censorship in Sweden uh, when it comes talking about talking to China. Mm. How about Swedish-China policy then? Has this campaign in any way 
impacted? How Sweden relates to China? Has it impacted Sweden-China relations? As Andreas mentioned, the Swedish government released a new China strategy uh, last week. And this is quite a big thing in Sweden because the Swedish government does, doesn't have any strategy related to one specific country until this strategy was released. Um, and the general tone of this strategy is quite critical. We can discuss it more in the Q&A if you're interested. When it comes to this campaign and the public affairs activities by the Chinese diplomatic mission in Stockholm, the strategy doesn't mention it explicitly. Mm. There's one passage in the strategy that states that China attempts to um, prevent the exercise of the freedom of expression in Sweden when it comes to Chinese circumstances. And you can read this passage as an implicit way of criticizing the activ activities of the Chinese embassy. That's one interpretation. But other than this, it hasn't been any uh, clear statement from the Swedish government criticizing this campaign. However, representatives of the Swedish government has told media that they are telling the Chinese counterparts that they expect them to respect freedom of expression in Sweden. Uh, but when it comes to public diplomacy, the Swedish government has been pretty quiet about this campaign. And I think also we should remember that many parts of this campaign are perfectly legitimate. The Chinese ambassador is engaged in discussion in the Swedish media about China-related issues. They are perfectly legitimate. Some people, however, in Sweden believe that part of the campaign comes close to threatening individuals in Sweden. It was one statement recently that called a Swedish human rights activist mad and uh, uh, wrote that Swedish media companies shouldn't do any business with this person. And this led to a rebuke from the new Swedish foreign minister last week, who said it was unacceptable to make this kind of statement toward individual people in Sweden. Um, so, At the same time that this campaign has taken place, other parts of Sweden-China relations have been more upbeat, not least when it comes to economic relations. And for those of you who followed China's relations with Japan in the past, people used to talk about something called hot economics, cold politics, even through periods where Japan's political relations with China were put in the freezer, the economic relations continued at the very uh, high pace. This is Chinese foreign direct investments in Sweden. And you can see here, both 2017 and 2018, they skyrocket. There's a lot of interest among Chinese investors investing in Sweden. The top graph is Chinese companies in Sweden. Wei Minhai was abducted in 2015 during the exact same periods we have climbed from around 70 to close to 120 Chinese activities, uh, companies active in Sweden. This graph is about employees in Chinese companies in Sweden. It's only uh, also growing, and I think we're close to 27,000 Swedes working for uh, Chinese controlled companies. Um, trading goods is also in increasing a lot. Exports primarily since 2016 has climbed quite a bit up to 2018. So economic relations with uh, between Sweden and China are quite positive at the same time as this political tensions uh, are taking place. And finally, how do we explain this campaign? Why Sweden and why now? Uh, The first possible explanation, obviously,
this way is that this is an attempt to pressure Sweden to adapt a more accommodating posture toward China. And why would China want to do that? Well, as Andreas also mentioned earlier, traditionally Sweden has had uh, a quite active approach to criticizing the Chinese government for the human rights situation in China and also for various uh, foreign activities of the Chinese government. In the European comparison, as our recent report that uh, UVI and 20 other European institutes, uh, including these, uh, wrote the other year, uh, we classified Sweden as one of the three countries, together with Germany and the UK, who are most active in criticizing the Chinese government when it comes to human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. So one possible explanation is that China want to pressure Sweden to adopt a more accommodating attitude toward China. Uh, but of course, the Guaymin Hai case might also have a role here. The Swedish government have, has both openly continued to criticize China uh, for not uh, guaranteeing Guaymin Hai's rights and also for not uh, setting him free. And the issue has also been elevated to the EU uh, level. But also behind the scenes, the Swedish government has been working very actively in, in uh, 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 dealing with this issue with the Chinese counterpart. So there has been a kind of Chinese, Swedish pressure from the Chinese side. So one possible explanation also is that, uh, sorry, from the Swedish side, so one possible explanation is that this might be an attempt to turn the tables, right? When Sweden is criticizing China for denying Wei Bin Hai his personal rights, China is criticizing Sweden for denying Chinese citizens in Sweden their basic human rights. Another explanation is that this might not really have that much to do about Sweden. Sweden is not a very important country to China. However, China could use Sweden to send a signal to others and to kill the chicken to scare the monkey, as the Chinese saying goes. Uh, by using Sweden as a test case, the Chinese government, according to this explanation, might pressure other countries, primarily European countries, to be wary about interfering with China's core interests. Um, so who's really driving this campaign? And of course, this is a campaign from the Chinese government and the Chinese foreign ministry but the Chinese government and the Chinese foreign ministry is not the monolith. They are different parts of the governments. And the unit of the Chinese government doing the actual work in this campaign is the diplomatic mission in Stockholm. Some people believe that this is a strategy launched from Beijing to pressure either Sweden or to send a signal to other countries. Uh, that the uh, 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 central government in China and the foreign ministry has given the embassy in Stockholm a mission to launch and carry on this campaign. However, an alternative explanation is that the embassy in Stockholm has quite a lot of agency in this unique campaign. The campaign started not long ago after a new ambassador was posted to Stockholm, Guai tsong -yo, who has also been the public face of this campaign. So an alternative explanation is that the embassy has making the decision to carry on this campaign and to sustain it for this long. One additional point is that how does the central government in Beijing receive intelligence about the situation on the ground in Sweden? Well, I think they rely to quite a big part on reporting from the diplomatic mission in Sweden. I'm not totally confident that the embassy, when reporting back, the effects of its activities 
are highlighting the more negative Swedish media coverage on China. So one hypothesis is that Beijing might not be fully aware about the exact effects of this campaign among Swedish media coverage and in Swedish public opinion. Thank you.